Hello and thanks for watching this Life Solved short. I'm Robin Montague, a writer at the University of Portsmouth, and in these videos we get to meet researchers who are sharing their work in the latest series of the Life Solved podcast. This is work that's changing our world for the better in all sorts of ways. Remember, if you'd like updates on our latest episodes, just hit subscribe now. Nearly all expectant parents take a visit to their local bookshop or head to an online store for the latest parenting manual. But what if the self-help advice they're picking up is actually teaching them unattainable goals? I'm joined by Dr. Lexi Shearer, a senior lecturer here at the university to explore how impossible parenting techniques can lead to a parent shaming culture and affect the mothers, fathers, and often children as a result. How can online forums and communities create a healthier and more supportive community for mums and dads? And how is an Australian charity leading the way in supporting young families with sleep? Lexi, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Lovely. So childhood studies, it's quite a niche area to me because when I think of, you know, the you know, humanities and that sort of department, child studies is a certain channel that maybe not everyone would think to immediately. But what drew you to that area? Yeah, so um, I think actually it's quite a wide degree in terms of it has kind of social science training, psychology and education. So our students often go on to do things like work in nurseries, um, work in schools, but it gives them that kind of breadth of transferable skills. And I think I quite liked that idea of equipping them to go into a range of different areas um, my background is sociology that's my PhD but this is I guess something more to do with an applied way of working with children in the degrees that the students and take. why children then what was it about that particular ah. subject <laughs> Why children? Yeah, so my PhD was sociology of childhood and before that I was a primary school teacher. Oh, lovely. My sister's a primary school teacher. <laughs> um, and while, I mean, it's it's not directly related to this, but, but it is in some ways. So while I was working as a primary school teacher, I got interested in children reading and the processes they went through to learn to read and their responses to the kinds of books that they learned to read with in school. And so I applied for what's called a studentship, which was basically a funded PhD and masters um, to look at kind of children's voice and how we can listen to them and account for them in research and research methods. So the project I'll be talking about more today draws on children's voice um, but that's kind of where the interest came from. It was through working with children directly in school and thinking in some ways we don't listen to them. Um, you know we might listen to their answers in exams or you know in, in class situations but not about things that affect their lives. And why do you think that is? Why do you think that we have a tendency to maybe discredit children a little bit when it comes to how they're feeling and reacting to things? Yeah well if you asked my students now they would often say that they um they sort of maybe they don't mean to lie but they're fantasists and make things up but maybe adults do that a bit too. Um, I think partly it's to do with resource and time you know in this country you often have 30 children in a class mm. and if you're in a situation where there's one adult and 30 children and lots of accountability then you've really got to get that learning done and, and meet those targets so there's not the time and the curriculum's I guess not designed to do that and also in some ways maybe we don't always want them to if it's listening to their opinions about sleep and when they want to go to bed or their opinions about what they might want to eat perhaps there's the uh, balance of parenting I guess. In particular what we're going to be talking about today is parent shaming as we mentioned in the intro and um, why was, again, this something that particularly caught your attention? Because obviously you did the teaching side, but you also have a personal reason for looking into this. Yeah, being completely transparent. I got interested in sleep because I have a very low sleep needs, tricky sleeping child. And whilst I had a small child, well, when she was a baby, really, I was literally pulling my hair out, trying to read all the advice. None of it resonated. What I tried didn't work. Then I felt like I was a failure. And so it was really in response to this living, breathing child that I just thought, you know, there's got to be another way. Um, and somewhere along the line, I guess my research interest kicked in because at first I just felt like I got it wrong. I just felt like I was doing it wrong and I'd got it wrong. And then somewhere along the line, I thought, hang on a minute, actually this is interesting in terms of my research. And it's interesting in terms of my research because where's the children's voice in this? Um, you know, where are the parents' voices in this? It's all this very instructive advice you must do this and you must do that and doesn't sort of 
look at kids in it. And so I remember I had my daughter in the sling. She was about six months old. And the only thing I could find was a pink pen, you know, basically like a wax crayon. And I started making notes, leant up against the wall with a pink pen. And that was the origin of this, <laughs> this sleeping baby who was asleep on me, trying to kind of make something of it and react against it a bit. I love the um, the symbol of the pink pen as well because it's something that children use and it, you're talking about children's voices so it all plays in quite nicely. And I have quite a lot of friends who are new parents and I have some friends that really took self-help um, books like you've been talking about uh, as sort of gospel and then I've got other th- friends that just sort of threw it out and went with their own intuition and it's hard to know what direction or avenue is the right one in the environment that we're in with social media and stuff because there's so many people telling you what's the right way and what's the wrong way. And then there's a book which you think, when I think of books, I think of them as, you know, quite a factual thing. They've been clearly researched, so they must know what they're talking about. But it is just really one person or a small selective group of people telling you what's right and what's wrong. Yeah. And I think I've got a bit of a problem with self-help as a genre, I think, because it's exactly what you said. It's too particular and narrow and sometimes it's too individual. You know, so if you follow my advice, you'll be happier. If you follow my advice, you'll get whatever it might be. And I actually think some of the better solutions, if we're talking about solving things to this, might be more communal and it might be about supporting each other, listening to each other, finding a range of solutions rather than one person who says, you know, if you follow exactly what I say, it'll, it'll all be all right. Um, yeah. And that's the research that you did. You had a look at some of these self-help books um, and then you compared them, analysed them to work out, you know, were there any sort of themes going through them? And I think we've actually got a few here, which really surprised me when I first saw them. Um, So a couple of quotes that you pulled out from some of the recently published baby books. Um, If she vomits, she must learn this will not go get her way. Simply clean it up, a quick kiss goodnight and close the door. If you do not act now, it will never change. They will stay there in your bed until they graduate from university if you let them. It doesn't seem very nurturing, does it? And nope. especially the second one as well about if you let them stay in your bed until they graduate from university, they'll, they'll basically just stay there and yeah. the comment on university that if you don't do this, this might affect your child's ability to be educated or their, yeah. you know, their future, which is quite a scary thing to yeah. imply, which is a sleep system that you've got with your child could potentially affect their university university experience yeah well I think a lot of these self-help books work on the basis of threat so you know if you don't do this um the suggestion is never that their advice is wrong you didn't follow it carefully you didn't show tough enough love you weren't exacting enough so you know they're saying you need to you need to do what um and I guess it's a bit inflammatory isn't it because all parents would want the best for their children um, and for their social and emotional development. So, you know, if you don't follow this, there's more. There's a moral dimension to it. If you don't do this, they'll still be in your bed when they're 18 and, like you say, affected adversely as an adult. And these are, again, just to repeat, these are relatively recent published baby books. Something else on here that jumps out is no bottles, breasts or high-class comfort shall be given from dusk until sunup. So that's the whole thing about, you know, there's always a bit of a stigma around breastfeeding and bottle feeding. Again, I've got a few friends that have had these issues themselves in terms of not knowing what they should and shouldn't do. Mm. And some women just can't. My mum couldn't breastfeed, so we were just on formula. Um, But that kind of, that phrase, it's a bit patronising. And also it just reminds me of something from like the 60s. It's quite an archaic command if that makes sense yeah no and what struck me as well about these as you said they're published recently but um so there's a paper that I've written with my colleague um, Amanda Norman who was my research assistant for the original part of the project and we looked at some of the older baby books and actually things published in the 1940s there's a book by someone called Truby King and it's not that different it's routine structure ignoring the baby and there's quite a lot out there that's mainstream now in the NHS that says they do need nutrition until they're about 18 months old overnight. So why would you tell people that they don't? So there's something about nurture and there's something more simply about kind of calories and nourishment. And then just finally, the um, uh, my patent in rope trick, tying the bedroom door shut with something like a skipping rope around the handle will no doubt offer disbelief, then rage and tears, but they will learn. 
very strict. Yes. Yeah. And again, it brings into question ethics. I mean, should we be locking people in rooms? If I invited you to my house and you said something that I didn't agree with politically or that, you know, offended my husband or whatever it might be, you know, you wouldn't treat an adult by locking them in a room. That would be seen as kind of, I mean, unethical at best and and abusive at worst. So this idea that it's a patented trick kind of almost sounds like it's funny. Um, But yeah, I'm just troubled by some of these suggestions and what they're suggesting about how we should be raising children in the 21st century. (laughs) And obviously, these are some of the more extreme quotes that we've asked you to put out for us. But how frequent were they? When you did your research project, how many of these self-help books were quite shocking? Was there sort of a, a range of them? They still had some good quotes and stuff put in? Yeah. And what those three quotes I found for you are three of the best selling. So Gina Ford, which is the one that's about vomiting, uh, the contented baby book is just possibly one of the most well known. She sold over a million copies. So we're talking about stuff that's super mainstream, super popular. Um, the patented rope cheek is Dr. Green. And I think again, it sold something like half a million copies. Um, and the middle one was Tizzy Hall, which was actually recommended to me by a friend. So these aren't kind of left field. Um, Now, some of what they say is more moderate. You know, they talk about the need to make sure you look after yourself as a parent and get rest and have balance. So to some extent, I guess the quotes are particular. But nonetheless, even if it's in there with more balance, I was troubled by that as part of... Because, like, how would you know which bit someone would take? Will people take the bit that is sensible and leave the rest? Or will they take it all without criticising it or without questioning it? I mean, you're an expert in this field, so when you're reading these, it wouldn't surprise me that you pulled out that these were quite, you know, shocking and um, troubling quotes. But there might be a lot of parents out there that read these books, millions, clearly, that read these books and, again, take them as gospel. So it's just worrying, isn't it? How, How can parents know who to believe and who not to believe? Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's also something interesting, which is about um, your background. So a friend of mine who lived in a really, really small flat ended up following the Gina Ford book, partly because they had to have that baby sleeping in its own space quite early because there was nowhere else, like they couldn't bed share. So the idea that there might be alternatives just might not be available to everyone. People have to go back to work earlier if they don't have enough space. So so whilst people might not take it as gospel they might feel they either out of desperation with tiredness or because of other demands on their time or their space that they have to um so I guess that's kind of sad if it feels that you're forced or trapped into doing some of these things Mm -hmm, definitely um but moving on to the positives though so you, you, you found these um you found these quite negative baby books but you decided to branch out a little bit try some new things look for new places and that's the beauty I suppose of the internet we have the internet at our disposal, um, plethora of information, loads of different voices, but again, there's a lot. So it's like if you go into a supermarket, you've got a shelf of soups. Sometimes it can be overwhelming and you have no idea which soup to choose. I do it a lot. And I imagine it's very similar to the internet and parenting guides and websites and forums, trying to figure out which ones to actually listen to and which ones to drown out. Um, which ones did you come across and found quite useful then? Yeah, well, and I think part of the problem is if a good friend recommends an established author, so like the Tizzy Hall book, which was the one, the vomiting, um, you trust that to some extent more than something you'd find online. Most of us are more, you know, is it a credible source? Um, Should I be listening to what this person says? Who even is this author? I mean, in the Tizzy Hall book, I had a reaction to it. I ended up, I literally threw it in the bin. It went in the recycling. I got very cross with it. Whereas things online, you could feel more lukewarm about, you know, so maybe someone's trying to market formula and sell their book. Um, or maybe it's just mum's net and it's just a cacophony of different voices. So what I found was actually something that was recommended by someone else. I was about to leave Facebook. I got a bit sick of the kind of uh, people liking their own photographs and kind of presenting a particular view of themselves that didn't seem very authentic. And um, someone in a baby group offline recommended someone called The Milk Meg, who is a IBLC. So she's an international board of lactation consultant certified person. And it was very much... At a particular point with the baby useful, so it was normalising breastfeeding, suggesting different hacks if you're having trouble with that. She offers consultations. Um, 
different positions to lie in and breastfeed and I found that resonated with me at a particular point like now I don't think it would be so interesting but so maybe it's finding something that kind of um, aligns with your parenting style and that's relevant to the age of your child so I then from that um, got a recommendation you know the algorithm is very clever if you like this you might like something else. So it wasn't actually my own research, it was Facebook's algorithm that found me, the Beyond Sleep Training Project, and I thought, ah, this is interesting and this is slightly different. But as I said, it wasn't something that I'd found myself. Um, it was it was Facebook that found it for me. Thank you, AI. You've got to love AI. Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> quite. They'll be doing the parenting for us one day. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you're just saying they're the Beyond Sleep Training Project and the Facebook group. What is that? Where did it come from? Yeah, so it was a group that was started up um, by a woman, Carly Grubb, who was a blogger. And actually, I didn't see the blog. It was before I was ever a parent. It was called Grubby Babies. And she kind of talked about, you know, I think just let it all hang out. And rather than some Instagram worthy, perfect home and perfect image of parenting, it was about um, how things can be untidy and messy and how we cope emotionally and with our mental health and how we meet children in the middle. Um, and that might not look pretty and it might not be easy, but as far as I understand it, that's that was um, where it originated. Um, and then she started up the group, the Beyond Sleep Training Project, as a space that was peer mentored. So there's a group of moderators and people put posts on there. And then there's quite a lot of evidence-based pinned posts, which are really, really helpful because it's the opposite of just trawling the internet with the soup analogy. It's kind of... Um, soup that has good nutritional facts and information and that somebody else vouches for if we use that analogy i like that that's very good soup of the month soup of the month there we go yeah featured soup featured soup and something like that is i suppose pre- fairly recently come about with yeah. the whole um you saying there the thing that drew you to the blog or that really attracted you to the blog was that it was very real it was honest so why was parent shaming, do you think, such a big thing? Ah, that's such a good question. I don't really have an answer. Um, I mean, I suspect it goes back a long time. And I suspect it's about um, shaming women, probably a bit more widely. I know there's lots of research about that, feminist research about what women wear and what they say and social class and women. So maybe it feeds into that. Um, maybe there's something particularly about when people are under pressure because they're tired and they're vulnerable that they're more likely to say things I know it happened to me things that get in your head so something that's a small comment um, can end up becoming amplified and feel shaming even if it's not meant to and also there are real um, what would you call them real implications if you get this stuff wrong so if you don't do sleep safely then it's then it can be dangerous you know there's risks of SIDS which is you know sudden infant death um so if you get it wrong if you get it wrong um it's not safe you know it's not like I don't know um if you dress a child in something that wasn't appropriate for a trip to the beach then the the worst that's gonna happen is you get sort of sand in your socks or something whereas actually if you get sleep wrong and you fall asleep on a sofa there is a risk of suffocating a baby for example so there is a there is a justification behind the shaming I guess which is if it's done unsafely it can be dangerous definitely and I'm sure the internet has insulted someone before for dressing a child in the wrong outfit for oh, the yeah. beach <laughs> it'll be on there somewhere yeah um and then obviously the beyond sleep training project it's there's a group of people there that curate it, which is really good because then you know that um, they've actually taken into account multiple voices or thoughts. Um, so what you're reading is actually, I suppose, tried and tested to an extent. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you think that that approach could be applied more widely then when it comes to parenting and self-help? Yeah, definitely. I think there's something about the fact it's a gentle space and a kind space that's incredibly important because it gets away from shaming. And actually, it took me a while to go, right, okay, how, if I'm posting something, could I reframe it? Could I reformulate it in a way that's supportive of somebody else? And that is, that's kind to the child and that's kind to you. And actually... If I don't know, this must like having a kindness, kindness um, auditing, and actually, can we all do with more of that? You know, I think it could be good in the workplace. I think it could be good in other aspects of parenting, like behaviour. Um, and if you see it modelled, 
then maybe you're more able to kind of practice it yourself. It can sort of calm people down and, and, and be something that's positive to take away, I think. You know, so you don't just practice it then maybe in that online space. You take it away and practice it in the offline space and your real lived experience with your children or, or in other interactions. So I suppose it's adjusting parent shaming to constructive feedback or constructive yes. advice. It's all about being constructive yeah. rather than, yeah. I suppose, aggressive and, and rude. Yes, um, thank you so much for talking with me, Lexi. It's all been really, really interesting. And I hope that some parents or soon-to-be parents or maybe people in the future will take some something from this conversation. There's so much pressure on new parents from society, from self-help books, and quite often from the parents themselves. And the risk is that at the time they should be enjoying life with their newborn or toddler, they may feel judged and inadequate. Let's hope the work being done here at the University of Portsmouth and by the likes of the Little Sparklers can help create a more positive parenting landscape. If you'd like to listen to our full episode of Life Solved, so we put parent shaming on the naughty step, head to the University of Portsmouth website or download it on your favourite podcast app now. You can click the link in the comments box below or head to port.ac.uk forward slash research to find out more. Next time we're back online exploring the pros and cons of AI and chat GPT. See you then.